Good morning, everybody. I'm Pastor Jason, and uh, Pastor Drew is not with us this week, but he'll be back next week. But we're so glad that each of you came uh, to be a part of worship this morning and spend time considering God's Word. If you join us outside, we're glad you're here. Or if you're at home, we're glad you're here, too. It means a lot to me to be able to see you and to see our friends and, and uh, familiar faces, and I hope this is an encouragement to you. Uh, today, I want to talk to you about being confident to endure. Confident to endure, and we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 in just a few moments if you want to turn there. Uh, but this is something that I just think the Lord is challenging me with, that, that there's a lot of things in our, in our world right now, or maybe just in my personal life, that, that I think I need endurance for. I think I need to, to persevere in. And as I go back in my walk with the Lord, I think often of Acts 4.13 when it talked about Peter and John, and it said that they had spent time with Jesus, and the fruit of that time spent with Jesus is that they were people of courage. They were people of confident boldness. They had courage to walk into tough things. And so as I pray for, just be real honest, as I pray for my wife and kids, I pray that God will give them confidence to endure. And I know the things that uh, God is asking my wife to endure, and I know the things he's asking my children to endure, and I know the things he's, he's calling me to endure, uh, but I don't know all of your stories. I don't know the things that God's calling you to endure this week, or, or what areas of your life you may need perseverance. But I pray this morning that you would find some encouragement from spending time with Jesus and going out of here with confidence to endure. Or that you would spend some time with the Lord this morning, and the fruit of that time you spend with him is you would feel like you have more courage to walk through the life that he's called you to. So we're going to begin in Hebrews chapter 10, if you want to turn there. And as we're talking this morning, I want you to think of the answers to two questions. Number one is, uh, where do you need endurance? Where do you need endurance? And the second is this, what tools of endurance does God offer you? Where do you have need of endurance, and what tools of endurance does God offer you? So let's begin reading in Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 32. We'll read uh, to the end there. Hebrews 10 and verse 32. But recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Verse 35, Therefore do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith, and if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and persevere their souls. Now we're going to skip over chapter 11, if you want to turn now to chapter 12. And the end of chapter 10 and the beginning of chapter 12 are like bookends on, on chapter 11. And chapter 11, is, we'll call it the Hall of Faith. These are men and women who, through the Bible, persevered and endured through uh, significant things. And so in the end of chapter 10, we read about enduring. And then we read stories in chapter 11 of, of all of these men and women who endured and persevered. And then the beginning of chapter 12 is very similar to the end of chapter 10. So let's now read in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely. And let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is seated at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Let's pray together as we begin. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the God of endurance. You are the God of comfort who comes alongside us and gives us courage. And so even as Peter and John spent time with you and they came away from that with greater courage, I pray today for my friends and my brothers and sisters who are here or joining us at home or listening later that, 
that they would draw near to you and feel their hearts emboldened with perseverance and endurance, that they would have the courage to walk with you in relationship to Jesus this next week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So what is endurance? In the Bible, that word endurance, it means to remain under. It's this idea that there's, there's something over us that's heavy, and to endure is to remain under it, especially as God enables the believer to remain under the challenges he lots in life. And why would we want to endure? Well, the Bible says in James that blessed is the one who endures. There is a blessing in endurance. And it's something that we're called to as believers in Christ. It's enduring the things that stress us out. It's enduring the frustrations, the irritations, the conflicts, those things that tempt us to shrink back or to quit, those things that tempt us to give up, those things that tempt us to, I don't want to go back there today because it was too hard yesterday. For me, one of the hardest things to endure is not external circumstances, but internal circumstances. External circumstances is someone says something unkind to me, or in order to get this project done, I'm going to have to spend two hours on really hard labor to get it done. Those would be external circumstances. And I'm learning to endure in those. But what's even harder for me personally is to endure through internal. And the first, we're going to go back in uh, Hebrews chapter 10. And we're going to see in verse 35, the Bible says this. Do not throw away your confidence. What does that mean to throw away your confidence? And when do you do it? The word there, throw away, it means to cast off like a garment. So when you go home at night and you're getting for ready, ready for bed and you take off your shirt and you throw it in the dirty clothes, that is to throw away your confidence. You take it off and throw it down. So the imagery that I have for don't throw away your confidence would be this. Put on your confidence. The greatest illustration of this I see in the Bible is in the story of Joseph. And the Bible says that his father, Israel, loved him more than all of his sons, and he made him a, a, a many-colored robe, or a coat of many colors. And so when Joseph put on that coat of many colors, did he know his father loved him? Do you think there was just a little extra bounce in Joseph's step when he put on that robe that his father had made for him? You see, Joseph put on his confidence when he put on the robe that his father gave him. And this idea of putting it on externally is a big one for those of us who've ever struggled with depression because there have been times in my life where there was nothing in my mind or my heart that could be confident in God's goodness. And so there were times where I had to put it on like a garment on externally until God brought me to that place where it would click inside, if that makes sense to any of you. How do you put on your confidence? This might be an idea that you want to develop a little more this week as you dig into God's word and you spend time praying about it. But I'll tell you what I pray for my wife and my kids every day is that God would make them confident in Christ. My wife and I, we send our kids out into the world every day and I pray the, the, the primary thing I pray for them is that they would be confident in Christ. What does that mean to be confident in Christ? It means that you know what Jesus has done for you. You know the, the great expense he paid to forgive our sins. It, it means understanding I'm confident in Christ that, that he has bought me with his blood and he has redeemed my life from the pit and he put his Holy Spirit inside and he said, I'm not alone. I'm confident in Christ of what's happening in my life today. If this is a new thought for you, I want to encourage us all with Philippians 1.6. And this may be a verse, if you've not memorized it, I want you to memorize it. It says this. I'm confident of this. That God who began a good plan in my life will carry it on to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. And so my question for you is, whatever you're facing tomorrow, are you confident that that thing tomorrow is part of God's good plan for you? Because this is where I get rattled. And when I get rattled, then I, I lose my confidence and I get a little bit insecure and I start feeling my ability to endure. Just It's, it's like someone put a hole in the balloon and it's going And by the end of the day, I'll just be in a puddle. I will be in a puddle in my room. My kids wonder, what's wrong with dad? Oh, he did not put on his confidence today and now he is a puddle in the bedroom. So how do we put on our confidence? 
when does God begin a good plan in your life? When does God begin a good plan in my life? Did God begin his good plan in March when coronavirus came to the United States? Is that when the good plan for Jason started? Well, that's part of it. But let's back up a little further. Did God's good plan start at Christmas? Well, yeah, that was, that was good too. But let's back up a little further. Let's go back to 1979 when J Jason decided to make Jesus his Savior and Lord and he became born again. Is that when God's good plan for Jason started? Yes, but it goes back further. Was it at Calvary? when Jesus shed his blood and died. Is that when the good work in Jason's life started? Yeah, but it, it goes back further. The Bible says in Ephesians that God chose Jason in Christ before the foundations of the world. Before God ever spoke into existence at creation, all that we see, the Bible says, he had begun a good work in Jason. And this is what I want you to hear today. If you are in Christ, if you have decided to make Jesus your Savior and Lord, the Bible says that he chose you before the foundations of the world. He began this good work in you even before he ever spoke light into existence. And this good work he's doing in your life is going to continue uh, through creation, through the Old Testament, through the Gospels, when Jesus comes and he's crucified and he ascends into heaven, through the New Testament, into your life when you were born, and then when you became born again. And it's going to go through this week. This week is part of God's good plan in your life. He started before the foundations of the world. That he will bring to completion and perfection at the day of Christ. Now that's something to put on your confidence. Today is part of God's good plan for me. What is God's good plan for Jason? He's going to be conforming me to the image of his son. And he's going to continue every day in this good plan, in this good work in Jason's life until he sees Jesus face to face. I hope for you, like for me, that puts all of the circumstances of my life into different perspective. There's not a hair from my head that falls apart from the care of my father. So every conflict I'm in, every frustration I'm dealing with, every difficulty I'm hoping that I doesn't happen tomorrow, all of these things, for whatever reason, fall under the sovereignty of God's plan for my life, and I can go into it confidently knowing he's going to help me endure. Young person, I don't know what you're going to have to face tomorrow on Monday morning. Some of you may have eight hours of Zoom classes that you're just dreading. Can you wake up on Monday morning confident that God's plan for you today is good? My dear friend, you have to go to work tomorrow. You have to face that coworker again who is just grading against you and it frustrates you to no end. Can you wake up tomorrow morning confident that all of this stuff on Monday is part of God's good plan for you that he began long ago? What do we put our confidence in? I do not put my confidence in myself. I see a lot of Christians, and they put their confidence in themselves. They put their confidence in their own strength. Well, I'm strong enough. I'm going to make it. I learned long ago I'm not strong enough. Or maybe it's I'm going to put uh, my, my confidence in my, my smartness or in my rightness. As long as I'm right, I'll be okay. I can be confident. And what happens is, as soon as you get in a conflict that, that you're wrong or someone disagrees with you, that starts chipping at your confidence if your confidence is in your rightness. I don't think God wants us to put our confidence in us. I don't think he wants us to put our confidence in our ability to be right. He wants us to put our confidence in the sufficiency of the completed work of Christ. And then instead of saying, well, I'm confident in my ability to do this, I'm a confident in my intellect or in my strength or I'm confident in my ability to relate with people. Instead of putting our confidence there, we put on the confidence of, I'm going to put on the confidence of the imputed righteousness of Christ. The Bible says that when God looks at me, he sees the righteousness of his son. So why don't I put that coat on today? Why don't I put that coat on that, Lord, I'm just confident that you saved me and that now you see in me the righteousness of Christ and, and I am your beloved son. That's what I'm confident in. And I'm confident that your plan for me is good, and so I'm going to walk into it today not having any idea what I'm going to experience, but whatever comes my way, I'm going to be confident that you're going to walk me through it because you never leave me, you never forsake me, and you're abiding with me by your spirit. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 says, Such confidence is ours in Christ. And David said in Psalm 27 that I'm still confident of this. He said, If I hadn't believed, I would have been in despair. But I'm still confident of this. I'm going to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. This is at the core of my endurance. It's the goodness of God. 
I'm absolutely convinced that my Father loves me and he cares for me. This is 1 Peter 5, 7. Cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. Do you really believe that? When you get in something you need to endure, do you really believe that God cares about you right then? Or are you tempted to say, oh, this is tough. My, God wants my life to be good, so he must have forgot about this little detail, and I'm going to have to figure it out myself. Brothers and sisters, put on the confidence of Christ. Don't throw away your confidence. Put it on every day. And at 10 o'clock on Monday morning, when your confidence gets rattled, put it back on again. I want this to be a tool for you that you would know how to put on the confidence of Christ when everything around you is suggesting that you should be insecure. First thing is put on your confidence. Second thing is this. The Bible says in verse 37 of chapter 10 that he who is coming will come and will not delay. There's a second principle of faith that you need to hold on to. Do you believe that God will come for you? When I was a boy, and I wish my parents were here, I would ask them how old I was, but I was a mama's boy. I did not like to ever be apart from my mom, not even to go with my dad. And on Sunday mornings, this was specially put to the test when it was time to put little Jason into Sunday school. Whether, I don't know, it's nursery, toddlers, I don't know how old I was. And I might have been 14, but I was still crying, okay? So, <laughs> and my dad says, no, you're gonna go. No, dad, don't make me go. I just wanna sit in church with mom. No, you're gonna go, all right? And then here's what he'd do. He'd kneel down, and he'd show me his watch. He'd say, okay, Jay, the big arm's here, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drop you off here. You're going to go to your class, and the big arm's going to go like this, and it's go all around, and when it gets here, I'm going to come back and pick you up. No, Dad, I don't want to go. Son, you're going. And then I would go. And then he'd come back and pick me up, and he'd show me his watch. He'd say, now look where the hand is. Did I come for you like I said I was going to? Yeah, Dad. Was it really that bad, Jay? No, Dad, it was a lot of fun. I had a great time. But what I learned as a boy is that from my earthly dad that he would come for me when he said he would. And now maybe not all of you have had an earthly experience like this, but the transition now to our Heavenly Father is a significant one, that we have to be men and women, boys and girls, who believe that when our Father says he'll come for us, he means it. And he's going to show up on time. Not on my time. I wanted my dad to come back halfway through the class. That wasn't my dad's time. My dad wasn't going to come down, come down and get me till the benediction upstairs, and then he'd come. God has promised all through Scripture that he would come for his children. In Genesis chapter 50, Joseph, at the end of his life, he says to the Israelites, he said, now be sure God will come for you. How long was it before God came? Because that was the end of Genesis. And then we get to Exodus and Moses, right? And then he spends 40 years in the wilderness. And then he comes back and he leads the Israelites out. And this is hundreds of years between when Joseph told him, your father will come. And then his father came. I think one of the problems of endurance is for us in this season of history is that we are fast food microwave believers. And when we drive through the drive-thru, we better have our food in 60 seconds, or we're going to call that little number and let the manager know how long it took. <laughs> and like me, if you put something in the microwave for 90 seconds, and it comes out and it's not right, I'm often so frustrated, I'll just throw it away and leave without eating, because I'm not going through that process again, it didn't turn out the way I wanted it, so I'm just done. I guess I'll go through a drive-thru or something, because that's faster than the microwave. You see, we... We expect what we want right now. And if we're going to be men and women, boys and girls of endurance, we're going to have to learn that sometimes God doesn't come as fast as we want him to, but he will always come. He will always come for his kids. In John chapter 14, Jesus says this, Don't let your hearts be troubled. Don't get upset. Don't get bothered. Believe me, in my Father's house are many rooms, and I go prepare a place for you. I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you may also be. I'm 44 years old, and I've seen God come on my behalf many times in this 44 years, but can I tell you the ultimate thing I'm waiting for God to come for me for? It's to take me to that place that he prepares for me. There is nothing on this earth that can compare with what God is preparing for me in heaven. 
I'm not going to miss motorcycles when I go to heaven. I'm not going to miss Duramax pickups. I'm not going to miss pontoon boats or lakes. I'm not going to miss my family. You think of the most wonderful thing you experience here on earth. It's not going to compare with the glory that's to be revealed. And so sometimes we get so bent out of shape and worked up about things on this life, and it's because we think that this is all there is, and this part of my life has to be great because if, if this... If this isn't great, the next thing, that's, it'll just be over and I'll have missed out. Absolutely not. The best thing you're ever going to experience will be seeing Jesus face to face. I tell my kids it's like fudge. When we were on vacation in Mackinac, we went for fudge. And fudge is a huge tradition in Michigan. My grandma made us fudge every year for Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I'm sure it came from the tradition of Mackinac fudge. To smell fudge, oh, it smells so good. To taste it is even better. And I asked my kids as we're picking out on fudge on our way back from Michigan. I think Stephanie bought four different ones. We got to try them all. I had a stomachache. <laughs> but I asked my kids, what if we bought all that fudge and we said, here, take a smell and then close it up because we're not going to eat it? What if all we had done is let you smell it? Brothers and sisters, this life is just the smells. It's just the smells. We have not tasted the glory of our consummation to Christ. We have not tasted the glory of what it is to be seated around the throne. We have not tasted the beauty of heaven. And, and do I want God to come in my life in some things this week? Well, absolutely. But if he doesn't come the way I want, am I going to get discouraged? No, because I'm waiting for him to come take me to himself face to face. That's what I'm waiting for. And I'm not going to give up waiting for that till it comes because he promised he would come for me. He promised that he was making a place for me, and he promised that one day I would see him face to face. That's something to endure for. First thing is put on your confidence. Second thing is he will come. Third thing is this. In Hebrews 12, chapter 1, it says this. We are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. If you want to be a person of perseverance and endurance, you have to learn how to dial the dial of your mental radio to the cloud of witnesses channel. And what I mean by that is this. There are things in my earthly life that I can remember. The cloud of witnesses is like our ancestors that have gone on before us. The cloud of witnesses is like the Alumni Association pep rally. Okay, so in my life, the cloud of witnesses on earth is like my grandpa was. I was a boy telling me, keep your chin up, tiger. What would grandpa say? He'd say, keep your chin up, tiger. You'll get through this, okay? And if you don't have those earthly examples of what uh, spiritual heritage is, just look in the Bible. When I say, listen to the cloud of witnesses, I say this. Listen to Father Abraham, who says, Jason, trust the Lord that what he says he'll do, he'll promise. And don't get discouraged and do it your own way, because I did that 10 years into the process, and it didn't work out so well, and I would another 15 years. It was 25 years, Jason, from when God promised to what he came. Trust him, Jason, Father Abraham would say. Or what about Uncle Paul? Comes along and says, Jason, come on, bro, it's not that bad. You want me to tell you what some hard times are? You're going to get through this. God brought me through it. He's going to bring me through it, too. Or what about when, when, uh, my cousin John the Baptist comes and says, Jason, have you lost your, you're losing your head over this, but don't go so far, man. I really did lose my head. Like, you're going to get through this. A few years ago, uh, you know, we, have mul we've, we had multiple Sundays here, and in fact, I think at one point we had three, and between services, I was preaching that Sunday, and I just had, I had some really hard conversations in between service, and it rattled my confidence. So I had to go retreat to my office, spend some time in prayer, figure out how to put the confidence back on so that I could get back up and preach again. And you know what I pictured? I pictured God rolling out the red carpet for me from my office back to the platform, and on both sides of the red carpet were the cloud of witnesses. And I heard Adam say to me, Jason, I listened to the wrong voices, and look how that turned out. Don't do that, Jason. All right, Adam, I heard you. And then I got a hug from Ruth, and she said, come on, Jason, I'm, you got a cloud of witnesses that's with you, but you're going to be enveloped into the love of the family of God, even though you feel alone today. Just keep going, Jason. And then I heard Esther, she knuckle-bumped me on my way down the hallway, and she said, Jason, maybe God's appointed you to speak right now. You just need to go do it. It doesn't matter what anybody says. And then there's Peter. Peter's like, Jason, you're doing great, man. You haven't messed up near as bad as I did. Just, just keep going, man. It's going to be all right. And see, so from my office 
to the platform, I was listening to the cloud of witnesses, those spiritual ancestors that have gone on before us that encourage us to endure. And the Bible says when you trust Jesus as your Savior and Lord, that you are adopted into the family of God. You're born again. And now all of this spiritual heritage that you find in Hebrews 11, that is your ancestry. Those are the, the men and women who have gone on before who give you great courage and encouragement that who God says he is, he really is. And what God says he'll do, he really does. You've got to turn on the cloud of witnesses radio. Number four in Hebrews 12, 1 says we need to cast aside all that closely clings to us. If you're enslaved in sin right now, you need to cast it off. It's going to really hinder your endurance. Maybe it's you're caught up in the cares of this life. You need to cast it off. It's a weight you don't need to be carrying. And fifth, the Bible says in Hebrews 12, 2, consider him. Consider him who for the joy set before him endured the cross. One of the greatest tools of endurance is when we consider Christ, when we look to Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, when we consider him who for the joy set before him. What was the joy? The joy was the completed work of Christ so that he would be seated next to the Father. So when I consider him and celebrate the joy that is to come, what I'm doing is I'm considering that Jesus has already won the battle. His work has been completed. And now he is seated at the right hand of the Father. And so the joy is, now for all of us who have trusted him, we have great joy ahead. Great joy ahead. You see, in this earth, the kingdoms of this world say that joy, we have joy, and then grief destroys it. But not so in the kingdom of God. In the kingdom of God, Weeping may remain for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In the kingdom of God, death may come on this earth, but the real life begins at the end of that. In this life, we are born into a sinful nature and being spiritually dead. And then through the goodness of God and the kindness of Jesus, he comes along and he makes us born again. We were dead, and then we were born again. We were weeping, and then we had joy. Joy always follows the difficulties of this life of the believer. And so we need to learn to celebrate that and rejoice in whatever God is calling us to endure. Friends, I don't want you to grow weary in doing good. I don't want us to get so discouraged about all the things that are circling around us that we would be tempted to just throw in the towel and say, it's just not worth it following Christ. It's just not worth it trying to do what God wants me to do. Or maybe you've gotten so frustrated with all that's going on in the church, you're like, you know what? I did my time serving the church. It's just not worth it. There's too much conflict. There's too much change. There's, there's too much difficulty. It just seems like I've been climbing uphill for 30 years, and I just, I need to be done. Friends, let's be people that endure. Let's be men and women of perseverance. I pray that God will strengthen you in your inner person that Paul talks about in Ephesians 1 and 3 where it says the same power that raised Christ from the dead is at work inside of you who believe. So be strong and courageous and endure. Let's pray together. Father, I don't know who I'm preaching to today, and maybe it's just for me. But God, if there's someone that's a part of this message today that is just feeling like they need to quit. God, I pray you'd minister to them by your spirit. If there's someone who's a part of this message that just feels so overwhelmed, they don't know if they can keep doing it. God, I pray that you'd encourage them and strengthen them. I pray that you'd help them to put on the confidence of Christ. God, I pray that you would help them to know that you're going to come for them. God, I pray that they would hear the cloud of witnesses that's cheering us on, like the pep rally I went to years ago at the football game. God, I pray that they would cast aside whatever difficulties or sins that are entangling them or the weights of this world. God, sometimes I just need to cast off resentments. I just need to cast off the frustrations I feel at other people because it's just going to slow me down. And God, ultimately, I pray that we could consider Christ this morning. Lord, if there's anybody here who has never trusted you as their Savior and Lord, I pray today would be the day of salvation and they would just come to you by faith, asking you to forgive their sins and inviting you to be the Lord of their life. And God, for the body of Christ at Bethel, I just pray you do a work that as we spend time with you, we would be men and women of great courage. God, make us courageous for the days we live in. God, make us courageous to serve you boldly. God, give us courage that as a church we would come together and figure out how are we going to reach the lost 
in this season. God, give us boldness and courage and endurance to figure out how are we going to engage people in discipleship during this season? How are we going to get our children's ministry done in this season? How are we going to reach kids for Christ during this season? How are we going to reach the teens during this season? How are we going to help people in our community know about the Lord during this season? God, please help us. Give us endurance, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.